afternoon here in Spain. <laughs> That's true. You'll then be going out for dinner. Yeah, exactly. Uh, it's nine early. <laughs> yeah, brilliant. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, so basically we're Gem's gonna talk about um what a brand actually is and why it can help our athletes, how to use social media to build the fan base, including getting all this no like and trust content, which I know Gem will go into in a lot of detail. Um, and then you may be using a blog and a website to mm -hmm. Um, and what to include on that and also how to go about finding sponsors and how to approach them so really really useful informative stuff and um, we'll ask you some questions at the end great that sounds good awesome guys well um let's just see if i can i'll just put that down let's see if i can see myself i can see you fiona but i can't see anyone else than me enough i'm just going to pin myself to the top and then there we go Okay, awesome. Well, welcome everyone and welcome all of you watching on the replay and it's uh, great to, to be here and hopefully it adds lots of value to you. Um, talking about um, athlete branding and how we can um, start right from the beginning and how important athlete branding actually is as, as athletes as we're progressing in our sport and as we want to step up the ranks and things get a little bit more costly and a little bit more serious as well. So, I want to start off by explaining a little bit about what branding actually is, because we have this idea of brand or brands and companies and things like that. And we think of Nike and we think of Apple, but actually um, it is quite a fundamental um, concept really of just how you are perceived in your environment or how you are perceived by people in your audience or in the world around you. That is your brand. And absolutely everyone, um, every athlete and anyone that is going to be doing uh, something a little bit different, stepping up, have um, a little bit more of a, a, a sort of presence in that audience or an impact, which you absolutely have. You are inspiring people, even if you don't know you are as an athlete. Um, it's very, very important to get your brand right, basically. Get your perception that you're giving um, the world or the way you're showing up to the world the way that you want to um, sort of craft it, if you like. But first things first, I want you, to, you guys to really listen in because it doesn't matter how far on you are in your sport. It doesn't matter if you're just starting out or you're just hitting in the national levels or the regional levels, or you're already a pro or you're aspiring at the kind of elite to pro level. This um, concept of athlete branding and the perception that you're giving um, to the world is really, really important. So like I said, branding is all about how people perceive you and the messages that you convey, whether that's actually things you say and the actual active messages you're writing or saying um, online or offline, um, as well as the messages you sort of convey uh, unawares or a little bit more behind the scenes, the so things like your body language or the way you behave in response to something that's happened in your sport. It's about the way you are remembered and how you stand out from others, how you are identified. And crucially, how people experience their interactions with you. Um, like we all know, actions speak a lot louder than words. So it's, um, it's all very well to say that I'm a very inspirational and motivational athlete and i am uh, got big inspiring dreams to go off and go to the Olympics, etc. But if in actually your day-to-day -day actions don't align to that, so you're not very committed in your training or you're not um, sort of dedicated and showing up and working through the tough times, or if you're very unsportsmanly as well, that doesn't really align to your bigger goals. So it's about how you are uh, showing up, how you are um, advertently uh, sort of sending out those messages to the world with your actions and with the things you say, but also inadvertently as well. So just your behavior, your body language and your interactions and reactions to things that happen. So like I said, branding is really, really important for athletes, mainly from a commercial side or the financial side, if you like. Now, it may seem a bit crazy if you're sort of um, still a teenager or still in, in college and kind of looking to step up the ranks to think about that kind of financial side but there will absolutely become a time where it's going to be make or break and it's a case of okay i need to train and there's as we all know the lot often the difference between stepping up to those right elite levels and just staying at the amateur level is actually our recovery so normally you know that's why professional athletes are um so good and how 
why they are such another level is because they have that time for recovery um, and to really focus on their training. However, you need to be able to fund that. Um, you, you need to be able to fund the ability to dedicate enough time to that rest recovery and that training as well. So a job that's kind of um, a, a nine to six five, six days a week is probably not going to be hugely compatible with um, top, top level sport. So we need to work, think about how we're going to find, uh, fund our sport. And it's a good idea to start the good practices right from the beginning. And one of the biggest um, sort of profit generators, if you like, or um, one of the most foundational uh, tools you need as an athlete making money and wanting to step up is having that brand. And these are some reasons why. So when an athlete has a brand, has a following, has an audience, they're more marketable, which means they're more interesting when you're going for positions in teams. If you're a team sport athlete or for instance, in tennis or something like that, where you've got leagues or um, <clears throat> wanting to partner with different organizations. When you have a brand, you have something that's a little bit extra than just saying, oh, I'm a good athlete, because there's lots of good athletes out there. Having a brand helps you differentiate. You can also command more lucrative and athlete-friendly um, relationships. So what I mean by that is, when you're um, a good athlete with good results, you might partner with a brand and that's awesome, but the brand is kind of in control because they're probably giving you a little bit of money or some free stuff um, and supporting you, but you don't have a lot to give back to them other than your results and your performance, which is, which is awesome, but we all know that it's, it's a little bit tricky always to be on top, top, top form. And sometimes we can't always perform at that level or you know things happen, injuries happen. But when you have a brand, then it's like you have more bargaining power in those relationships. So instead of going to a brand and just saying, um, yeah, can you give me some free trainers and I'll, I'll, you know, compete in my sport, you can actually um, start to shift the, the control, if you like, a little bit more in your favor or start to negotiate. So, hey, you go, okay, it'd be, they offer you some free kit and you say, well, actually, I've got a significant following. I've got a website. I've got a blog, which has lots of exposure for your products. So let's talk about how you might pay for my competition or you might pay for my training, for instance, and you have more bargaining power. You also have more measurable partnership opportunities. So it's much uh, easier to have these relationships and start um, sort of having negotiations in those relationships when you have something physical to show or something numerical to show. And when I talk about branding, I'll come onto it a little bit later about social media and things about websites, etc. That means you can track how um, sort of your stance it, in, in your audience or how much impact you have, how much influence you have in those audience audience members. So things like how many people view your website or how many people view your blog or how many people are saving your posts or sharing your posts, these sort of things. Um, it's also a great way to think beyond your career as well. Now, I know if you're just starting out, this seems a long, long way away, um, but we all know as sports people, we've got a relatively short career as opposed to something like being a financial banker where you might continue to do a 70. We're going to stop, you know, around depending on your sport late 20s 30s or a push if you're um, a crazy iron man maybe maybe 40s um but it's kind of dependent but then there is life after athletics of course um and also times when maybe we're not able to compete for personal reasons or for physical reasons or whatever so it's important to have something that uh, gives you different opportunities as well alongside your sport and it makes your career more sustainable if you like um, and also, I love this part about if you're actually de a, developing a brand, you're developing a persona, and you're developing um, what we'll talk about later, which I call brand real estate, where you're actually um, creating platforms to share uh, about your story, about your, your um, trials, tribulations, struggles, and how you're overcoming them in the sport, then you can spread your positive impact, that positive motivation, influence that you can have as an athlete, further and that builds a supportive fan base and a super fan base as well so they're powerful things these brands so let's talk a little bit about building your brand now there will be some pretty familiar faces on here that we all know but i want to start you thinking a little bit more about what makes them so so we have apple which is well known for its kind of simplicity and, and the user friendliness of their 
their products. And then we have Nike with, with their sort of kick-ass persona and their real kind of um, motivational um, stance and everyone buys into that. And then we have Tesla, which is really future focused and very kind of very top end, very niche. We have Simon Cowell, who made a name for himself by not being very nice, um, but he's like, he's the softy underneath, and, and that's how he made his persona. And we have Piers Morgan and Need I Say More, and of course, the Kardashians as well, which are such, I mean, love them or hate them, they are quite a clever brand in terms of what they've done to be able to attract um, attention from different, different ways. So here's some bigger brands. But there's lots of different aspects that make up brands as, um, as we go. Now, we, on that last slide, we saw some companies, but we also saw some personal brands. And a, an athlete brand is similar to a personal brand, which just um, changes the content a little bit. And there's several aspects, like I say, that makes up that perception that we ultimately give to our audience. So there's things like visual aspects. So the logo or your kit, um, or it could be visual aspects in, the, in terms of your body language and the way where you show up and your behavior. There's also language, of course, so how they speak. So American Express has the kind of we look after you come what may sort of um, messaging out there. Uh, Band-Aid has a song that everyone knows in America and we all know we buy any car and compare the meerkat and all of these things, which are the auditory components. So things that make us remember that brand and make them stand out. We also have things like Disney and they really, their forte is their emotion. So you don't go to Disney just to go and buy some cheap toys. You go to, to Disney because anything's possible in Disneyland. And it really brings us back to our childhood if we're a little bit older or connects us with that, that fun and playful side. And they really major on emotion. And then there's things like Unicra. So what stands out? So Target made its, made its name by having very, very, this is the, uh, the brand for Target, which which is a big um, store in America. Uh, and they made their name by um, sort of using co coupons and the cheaper products as well. And then Starbucks is just consistent. It just, wherever you are in the world, you can get an overpriced, bad tasting coffee. And it will be the exact same overpriced, bad tasting coffee, no matter which country you are. And their consistency is why people love them and they keep on coming back. So a different, lots of different aspects, lots of different layers that make up that overall perception and it makes these um, brands what they are. So like I said, lots of different things to consider um, and it's kind of layering on top of each other. So we have things like the look, so how um, you present your, yourself and that can be the way you are very confident, the way you show and display yourself when you are in the public eye. That can also be things like your social media feeds, so how, uh, how you uh, deliver content and how quality um, that content is. And it can also be things like the logo that you might have or you might choose to have. Story and emotions as well. So how do you tell your story? I'm sure you all have very, very interesting and unique stories about how you've got to where you have in the sport. And let's be honest, no one gets there on a totally smooth, um, you know, total upwards trajectory path. There's always trips and, and stumbles and trials and tribulations. So telling that story really authentically is a really key part. Um, and that sort of goes uh, alongside the relevancy and the magnetic messaging as well. So thinking about how you are sharing that, uh, the parts of your, your story or how you're overcoming challenges or how you're stepping up that level, that next level in your sport. Um, and how do you can make that relevant to people? So knowing who is in your audience, knowing who's listening or who is, who is doing the perceiving of you and being able to tell that story and tell your story in a way that makes sense to people. So you've got to remember that not everyone you talk to is a triathlete, is a runner, is a steeplechaser, is a tennis player. So when you use some of the, the words that you say in the clubhouse or with your coach, it's gonna be complete gobbledygook to someone else. Even, so I'm, I'm a triathlete and I've been triathlete for uh, quite a while now, but like when I'm talking to people from another sport, like even just pure swimmers, for example, sometimes I hear things that they just say in their club and I'm like, what is that? Like, I don't, I don't understand. Even though it's the same, same, but different, it's not the lingo that I understand. So making sure that your, your story and the message you're conveying is appropriate for the audience. Because of course, when I'm talking to triathletes, for example, I can 
talk about what's and I can talk about training peaks and I can talk about the transition and all of those things we know in triathlon, but that may, may not make sense for another audience. So making sure we're always thinking about that audience as well. And that will really help build that trust and authenticity. It's really, really, really key that when you're developing your athlete persona, your athlete brand, that you're really, really authentic. Everyone can see through someone that's being fake or trying to be something they're not. And that is not the goal at all. It doesn't matter um, what your brand is and how far along in your sport you are or how early you are in your sport. You just need to be authentic and authentically you. There are far too many people, far too many athletes out there to try to be like anyone else. But your spot hasn't been taken yet. There is only one of you. You only have, uh, there's only one story that's like yours. And so you need to own it. You need to be authentic. And that will start to develop the trust and the relationships, which you see as well, which is a key building blocks of that brand. And then finally, we need a place to sort of convey all our messages and show up and show up to our audience. And that way is where brand real estate comes in. And I'll explain a little bit more about that later on in the presentation as well. So just keep this in your mind. Lots of different layers of your brand um, building on top of each other. It's multifaceted. But overall, it's how we perceive you as an individual, how you stand out from others and how you make us feel when we interact with you. Okay, so there's a few key things when we're drilling a little bit deeper into the nuances of your brand that are a really good idea to figure out. So we're going to move on to talking about content a little bit more. But what I want to do before that is I want you to identify the top three values that you really, really want to communicate. So this is probably um, a little bit strange, something you may not have thought of before, but I want you to think about what you really, really care about. If you were given a stage for a TED talk, for example, and you had 10 minutes to talk about things that you really cared about in your life, and you had one shot for making a big difference in the world, what would you talk about? So you might talk about sort of healthy eating and nutrition and, and um, or wellness and looking after yourself as an athlete outside of sport, for example. You might talk about how dedicated you are and how committed you are to um, reaching the top ranks in your sport and, and how you've dealt with the sacrifices you've had to make and how you keep yourself motivated to get up at 5am to go training. And you may that may be your real driving force that you want to share with other people to help them and motivate them. Or we've seen quite a lot of this in the news. You might be quite a passionate advocate about mental health in sports. And it's a massive, massive topic, um, as we know. And, and perhaps you've had, um, uh, you know, a, a period of struggle or that's something that's quite important to you. And you feel that you can give um, something to your audience and uh, positively impact on that topic. It doesn't really matter what it is. It can be having fun in your sport. It can be inclusivity. It can be um, just striving to be the best you can, you can be and just closing out from everyone else and not worrying about the competitors, just being your best you. But I want you to have a think about the three key messages that you want to focus on for your brand. Don't try to do everything and don't try to conquer the world and, and cure world hunger and all of the rest of the things. But what really, really matters deep down in you um, and how would you like to influence your audience positively pushing these messages? Once you understand those kind of values, you can think about what your one liner would be. So we have it with the other brands. We have a, a little slogan underneath and we know what those brands are about. So I gave you the example of Apple, which is just about cons consistency and simplicity um, and user friendly. That's, that's kind of where they started. We have Tesla, which is always future, uh, future focus and pushing the boundaries. And that's what they're, they're about. No one's like a Tesla. No one's doing the same thing. I want you to think about what one liner you could summarize um, your kind of your brand with, how you um, show up to your world, how you add um, value to them. So, for instance, I give the example, uh, I'm a rower with, um, and I share health advice and da uh, daily mindfulness tips. So um, that might be someone that's in uni, for example, that's doing um, really pushing forward on um, their rowing skills, but 
their summary of what content and what um, messages they put out there as the athlete brand is, is about um, healthy, healthy living and daily mindfulness. So looking after the mental health as well. But that's just an example. It can be anything you want, but see if you can summarize your kind of key points or key messages or key um, USP, unique selling uh, proposition is what we call it in sales, but the unique thing that makes you special and makes people want to have a piece of it um, just in one sentence. So probably something to go away and think about after this, um, but start um, playing around with ideas in your head, drop, drop down a few things. Okay, whenever you're doing this, and as we go through the next step as well, I really want you to remember that at every single stage, I want you to ask yourself this question. Is this authentically me? Is this really who I am? Like I said, there are far, far too many people out there for you to even consider trying to be someone that you're not. They're already taken. So you just need to really be, uh, absolutely own yourself as you are. And it is absolutely good enough, whether you are in day one or you're in day bazillion. Honestly, no matter where you are in your sporting journey, you are absolutely enough, you're good enough, and you have something great um, and great value to bring to the world uh, as you step up into that brand. So really, really own that. Be prepared that, yeah, just like, just like uh, in any other situation, not everyone is going to get along with the content or the brand that you create yourself. Not everyone is going to perceive you in the super positive light that, um, that other people will, but that is totally fine. It's totally normal. If we ask a hundred people in a room, if they like strawberries, probably not all a hundred would say yes, but I love strawberries and that's great. And I, I will go and I will go and have them and enjoy them, etc. Well, some people will go and choose something else. Your brand is exactly the same. As an athlete, there are lots and lots and lots of athletes out there and lots of people with lots of different stories, but there's room for you and one more story all the time. Because if you are just showing up in your authentic and unique self, no one has done that before. So just remember that as we go through. Okay, so when we start talking about, um, just one second. Ooh. Yeah, sorry, my slides just froze a second. We've gone off, there we go. Uh, so when we start talking about content, which is what we're going to start talking about next, we've identified what a brand is, but now we need to work out how we share it. First things first, we need to know who we are speaking to. Just like I alluded to before, there is no point in talking gobbledygook to an audience that don't understand it. There's no point in talking about the ins and outs of power to my mum, for example, because she doesn't even know what a power meter is. The only power she understands is on the electricity bill. So it's just gobbledygook to her. So you've got to think about who your audience is. Now, the audience, obviously, your audience won't be the same all the time. For instance, if you're invited to do a talk with a school, for example, your audience is going to be very, very different to if you're speaking to peers or um, so people in your squad, for example, which is going to be very different to if you were invited to do an after dinner speech at a um, sponsor's event. So if you partner with a company and you are going to connect with them to do a motivational talk for some business people, for example, your audience is going to be different. So you need to know who you are speaking to and you need to adapt your messaging style still from a place of authenticity and, and sort of uh, all encompassing um, the brand and the perception you want to create, but you're going to have to think about who you are talking to. So, one of the things you'll probably start to focus most on when you're developing your brand is social media. Um, and this is what we're going to come on to in just a second with the types of content that will really make you stand out on that platform, on your platforms. But um, one of the fundamental things we kind of forget on social media is it is social, which means there are two way interactions. So when you have friends or followers, we um, often just think about it as just putting out content, putting out content or, um, or the other way, just consuming content, consuming content. But actually, there needs to be this two-way interaction. You need to know what um, to put in to get the positive um, likes and the saves and the shares out. And that means you're going to have to do a little bit of listening. So 
I'm not going to tell you now to just go on your phone and, and scroll through and think that's good enough. I want you to look at this a little bit differently. You probably do spend quite a lot of time on social media um, a day or when you have free time, you'll probably find yourself scrolling. However, this is about strategically thinking about your brand and how to develop content that is really gonna resonate and stand out from your audience. So what I want you to think about is dedicating 10 to 15 minutes a week where you actually go and go into social media with a purpose. I'm looking at these four points. So what posts are getting engagement? So look at some other athletes that are a little bit further on with their branding or they've got bigger followings and see what posts are really rocking and which ones kind of a flopping and see if you might be able to make a list of some content ideas that you could recreate along those lines. And what questions are people asking? So you can scroll down on their comments as well. And maybe someone put out a run workout on the track and then they get loads of comments going, can you share a workout? Or can you share best tips for not getting injured on a track? Or can you share best tips for running in the heat? And you could um, take note of those questions and then make your content in relation to that. Things like trending hashtags, depending on what platform you use, but um, you can have a look on the Instagram Explore feed, for example, and see what's sh showing up, see what's re recommended to you, um, and see the content that is really doing well on those, on those hashtags. And then exploring your niche as well. So you can go and use those hashtags again, but if you're a runner, you could do um, a specific a running topic like um, running after Achilles injuries or um, a hashtag that's kind of like hashtag rehab, for example. And if you are an injured athlete and you're talking about that or hashtag um, 10K, uh, 10K run or, or 10K Olympics or whatever. And have a look at the content that's doing really well and see if you can make a, a note of that or a mental note of that. Um, so you know and you can be guided from those audience members as to what content they're going to enjoy and therefore what content you can create as well. Okay, so obviously was when we're doing this listening and when we're starting to explore what's going on already and what people are asking for, what people are enjoying, we want to identify where they hang out, where our audience or where the audience we want to break into is hanging out. So if you're just starting out in social media and you haven't even got that many posts up yet or you haven't got any other uh, posts up as an athlete, this is a really fundamental um, thing to nail. You don't want to be on every single social media platform. If you read that online, it's nonsense. You do not need to be on Pinterest, LinkedIn, YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, Snapchat, TikTok, all of them at once. You just need to be in one or two places and do them really, really well. Even just one is absolutely fine. You can absolutely nail your Instagram, absolutely nail your YouTube and not worry about anything else. But if you are wanting to build your audience, you wanna build some fans in the running space or, um, or you really want to share a message about managing athletics as a university student and balancing it and that's your your values your three topics that you really want to to push on where kind of mental health as an athlete managing um college or university and athletics and maybe some like maybe financial struggles as an athlete at a university for example you're not going to really get much engagement if you start going on LinkedIn. Like LinkedIn is not gonna be the appropriate platform for you to talk to university students that you're trying to talk to your audience. Whereas something like TikTok or Instagram may be ideal for that audience. So different platforms um, talk to different people. Another example is probably a bit um, of an older demographic than most of you guys here, but ultra running and Twitter and the slightly older age groups does really, really well. So lots of um, people love um, Twitter when, um, yeah, there's lots of, sort of hashtags, lots of activity around running for the slightly older age group. So that would make a lot of sense. Whereas TikTok or Snapchat, if you're a slightly older athlete, maybe like 30s, um, probably wouldn't make sense. So just think about where your audience is and the majority of the people you want to speak to are hanging out. So like I said, there's the main platforms. We have Instagram and Facebook, which we all know about. These are probably the easiest platforms to start on because they're kind of, we've been brought up with them. I personally much prefer Instagram to anything else. If I'm going for one um, pro 
platform, I always go for Instagram because it's got so many opportunities. You can do videos, you can do Instagram TV, which is longer videos. Um, you can do main feed posts and you've got the stories behind the scene. Um, and it's also quite good with a hashtag so you can search. Facebook is an option too, and you can do little groups on there. So if you are building your audience and you want to do a little event or you want to do some talks, Facebook works. YouTube, if you're a whiz with a video, YouTube is awesome because you can share so much videos, really get your personality showing, and you can do some really fun stuff on YouTube as well. Um, I'd also say some of the algorithms make it a lot easier to sort of rank a little bit higher, so it's easier to get organically, to organically grow sometimes, especially now with the algorithm changes. But for other people, YouTube is a bit alien um, and quite hard to get into, but do your research on YouTube, it's worth a look. Now, if you are someone that's not really into social media, but you do love writing or you like to do race reports or you have some special skills, so you're awesome at data or you're really good at kind of analyzing different workouts or different races or you like to follow along what the pros are doing and report um, on your um, expectations for who's going to win, etc., then blogs are a great opportunity. Really nice way also to um, link in little reviews of sponsors or brands um, and it can be a nice opportunity to get some um, additional revenue as well. So additional income sources. People can actually um, charge or you can charge as a blogger to review different products and feature it on your website or on your blog. So something definitely to look into. So like I said, I would really focus on social media on showing up on one or maximum two platforms, but the idea is not for you to just get bogged down in social media land. There's no need and there is no point and there's no advantage really. You want to work out, of course, where they're gonna hang out. So if you're only going for um, sort of the older age group that are ultra runners, maybe you, Twitter is the right place, but don't bother going anywhere else. Um, whereas if you're looking for a younger audience, um, TikTok and Instagram probably your, your best and YouTube your best choices so you think about number one where people are actually hanging out because otherwise there's no point in putting out content if no one's listening but from there it's really about you what do you love to create which content do you love to create do you are you absolutely like rock star with a camera and you love taking pictures well maybe Instagram and a beautiful feed is perfect do you actually love videos and you have a GoPro and that's totally your thing? Well, then YouTube is a no brainer. But you've also got to think about your resources. So maybe if you don't have a camera that's appropriate for YouTube, maybe don't even start there. Just start with your iPhone. You can easily do Instagram. Uh, your time as well. So YouTube videos might take slightly longer, whereas, you know, obviously Snapchat is an instant thing. Twitter is just a one liner, although I would say Twitter one liner is quite hard to <laughs> create in my experience. Um, and also your skills or desire to learn those skills. So things like Pinterest is something I'm looking into right now for one of my businesses. Um, and I don't know anything about it yet, but I'm really uh, excited to learn about the platform because I enjoy um, consuming content on there. So if you have desire to learn, there's no harm in doing that either. But just think about these things. Don't try to conquer the world. Don't try to be a, uh, a marketing agency. Just nail one platform. So we know who we're talking to, we know what a brand is, and we know where we're going to post it. But what content will you put out? Now, no matter what platform you choose, the content you put out will be um, exactly the same on these three fundamental um, sort of types of content, which I'm going to explain. Now, a great athlete brand is made up of three components. It involves a lot of people knowing who you are. This is where we have the Adam PTs and we have the Phelps and we have uh, the bigger brands of people um, that have really made a name for themselves in the sport, the Brodies, etc. A lot of people know them. They have big social media followings, big offline followings as well. And that is one component because if you want to sort of um, build those audience relationships, build those fan, that fan base, build those um, relationships with sponsors. We need more people to know us because if you imagine if, you know, a thousand people knew you and knew you quite well or could recommend you, your opportunity to get sponsorship or to get uh, know, a gig with a team or um, whatever it would be is going to be significantly larger than if you, only 10 people know you. So it's just a fact. You know, it's a, getting good content out there and growing your following is important. But there's no point in having content out there if 
you know, no one really enjoys what you're doing. Of course, when you're building a brand, we want people to like us as well. So that's where we think about listening to our audience and listening to what they want and what really switches them on or energizes them or what questions they're answering, asking, sorry, and you can answer. So that's about getting more people to like us. Um, so it's, you know, putting content out, there, content out there so you can grow your following and showing up regularly on social media. It's about putting good content out there that's high quality and, and talking to the audience in a way that they understand. Think about me um, talking about power to my mom. You want, I'm not going to talk to her in a way that she doesn't understand. I'm going to talk to her in the way that she does so she'll enjoy my content. But the real key is building trust because if you want a following that is a true super fan following, that's a supportive following that will be on your journey and pass on that good luck or that well done come what may and that will um, help you build a really engaged following as well then trust is really really key now just like in the real world trust isn't something that just happens we don't just trust someone the minute we we know them it takes some nurturing it takes some time but it is the real gem so it's worth doing so to build trust, you need to focus on three types of content. And there's only three types of content that you need to worry about, no matter what platform you're on, to build this absolute golden nugget. And they are connection, relevancy, and value content. So really dive in now, bit of pattern interrupt here, come back to earth, stop your scrolling, close down the tabs, etc., and really focus in on these three types of content I'm about to tell you, because that's all you need to do on social media, and you can forget about everything else. Okay, so the first type is connection content. To build trust, we really want people to feel like that we understand them, that we, we get them. So here is a really nice example from Lucy Charles, who's an awesome triathlete, and she's just getting really honest and really authentic and really real with her cheesy pizza in Lanzarote and just being like the, the, the fun her that she is. And there's no fancy filters on this there's no you know she's got card in the background it's no fancy media team it's just her enjoying her pizza because this kind of content is showing that she's a real human and she's not just perfect all the time and she's just like the rest of us so connection content is where you can get that vulnerable and share that i had a really really bad day or i had awful session so people like know that it's not all um bells and whistles all the time it's not all winning because none of us um for unfortunately are like that day in the life too so sharing a little bit more of what it's really like um to be an elite athlete or to be that sort of up and coming star share that um sort of behind the scenes and um, content and a great way to do this is instagram lives ig lives so you can um come on and just talk through what you've just done or a really hard track session, or you can, you can meet um, with a squad mate as well. And you can have a little bit of a chat about a tournament or a competition, etc. This is a chance to really share your perspective, ask your audience questions and just create content that's like, yeah, me too. That's what the audience was saying. Yeah, totally. Like I totally relate to this real human. And that's the idea with connection content. Next is relevancy content. So relevancy content is stuff that people might share with their, um, with their teammates or with their friends, or um, this is stuff that um, people might take away and use themselves. So that's relevant to your sport. So this is Anna Coburn, who's a great athlete over in Boulder, a lovely lady too. Um, and she's sharing her workouts and her lifestyle tips um, and sort of hacks and tricks. So here she's just doing, she goes through on her multi-way post and um, showing her different exercises that she uses in the gym. But this is a good way just to show um, sort of valuable content um, and share uh, things that her audience, her other runners in her audience might take away and implement themselves. So it's things that are really relevant to the sport. So this is the opportunity for me not to worry about my mom who doesn't understand the triathlon and doesn't understand power, but you know, explain about how I've up my watts or up my FTP by four watts this month and what I did to do that. So people can take it away and implement themselves. Now, the absolute gem here is the value content. 
Now, Ross Edgeley is an awesome, awesome guy, and you should look him up if you don't know him. He swam around Britain. He's a Red Bull athlete, and he's a really, really super nice, humble guy. He is also a giant, um, and there's quite a funny picture on Instagram of myself standing by him, and he is literally like eight times my size, but he's a very gentle giant, and he puts out great, great content. And he basically summarizes um, articles and um, various bits of research that he's done into something that's consumable bite size um, explainer of it. And it's really, really valuable stuff. So he shares about um, the metabolism and, and different ways to um, get his body to um, deal with all of the different difficult challenges that he faces um, when he's putting himself through all these physical um, tests and challenges like, like swimming around Britain. But he's a great um, sort of athlete to look, look at and whose content you can sort of reverse engineer because he gives so much value. He gives lots of reviews, he gives tried and tested, he tests things out for his audience and then shares uh, about them and the pros and the cons, etc. He gives session examples um, and he summarizes these, these reviews as well. So this is a really nice one to think about. And this is something you can absolutely do. You don't have to be a genius, you don't have to be a PhD student to be able to um, read a um, read a, a chapter of a book, for example, and summarize it in your own words into a bite-sized chunk. So if you are someone that's very interested in aerodynamics, for example, it's a really good example. Well, lots of other people don't understand it quite, but you might have read an in-depth article, in-depth blog, um, or an in-depth book, for example, and you might be able to summarize that down and give the five gem points that you learned from that and share that with your audience to have a think about that and how you can um, add value. Okay, so relevancy content, connection content, value content is a massive, massive, um, important way to build um, that trust factor. Also, taking the uh, on the ground online as well. So making sure that your perception, the way people perceive you, your brand is consistent no matter if you're in person or on or online, that's a really big one for this trust factor. So you don't want to be super lovely and give loads of value and share lots of things online and um, really positively. And then offline, you act like a complete numpty and are really unsportsmanly or you're not. Uh, if people come up to you and say, well done, you just completely blank them. It's not going to be very cohesive. And that um, starts to kind of... Um, show itself really and you can lose lots of uh, lots of friends um by doing that so make sure that you're authentic at all times online and offline but when you're taking um offline or on the ground events online that could be a nice way to share a little bit of that relevancy that um connection and that value content as well so um behind the scenes content is a great one so the fear of missing out. Lots of us have it. If we're going to a, a national competition or you see these people in the Olympics, I don't know about you, but I'm loving the athletes that are going behind the scenes in the athlete village and sharing all the like the, the secret things that you'd never know if you weren't there. So it's a really nice opportunity to go behind the scenes, share the good bits, the bad bits, the stupid things you do that makes you sound like a real human. Uh, or the not shown on TV bits. So this is a cool um, way to sort of... Um, really bring everything together and focus on that relevancy, that um, connection and that value all at once. So here are some ideas for you that you see. And of course, when you're starting out on this, it's not always super easy at the beginning. Like you have to play around, you have to find what works and some posts are gonna absolutely ace it and you're gonna get loads of likes. Other posts are gonna completely flop. And other times Instagram or Facebook or YouTube are just testing out things on their algorithm and you posted at 10 a.m. and they changed it at 10 1 a.m. and then suddenly your content doesn't get shown to anyone. So don't take it too personally at all. But you can do a few things to promote your position basically in the algorithms and make sure your content is the right kind of stuff. And it's as basic as reverse engineering people that are already doing it. So this is one of my mentors kind of in the business space, but a guy called Mark Lack, and he's got, got like maybe 150,000 Instagram followers and he's got some awesome content out there. And you can see his video got 25,000 views. So he's kind of like doing pretty well on Instagram, but you just go into these, like look at a few key individuals, pick four, pick five, of people's content who you really like, people you respect in your space, and see what they're doing that's rocking and acing it, and see what's not doing so well, and see if you can create similar 
posts in your own style, um, similar to the content that's really doing well online. Now, in terms of how often you post, I always get this question, and you're probably thinking it yourself, but um, you just want to be practical and you want to be sustainable. So do not like think you have to post multiple times a day on multiple channels because probably, well, you might achieve it for a couple of days and then suddenly life will get in the way and then you'll go from bazillions of posts to no posts and lots and then none. And it'll be really um, inconsistent. And like I said, one of the consistency, um, one of the factors of trust is consistency. Think of Starbucks, everything is just always the same. We love Starbucks because we can always get the same bag coffee. So just think about a sustainable and practical schedule. If that's two times a week, if that's four times a week, four times a week is a really good number. If you can aim for that, great. If you can do seven, awesome, but don't try to do seven and then fail at it, basically. Make sure you can do a sustainable and practical schedule that works for you. There are a few handy tools to help you out as well. So these are ones to take note of. Later and Tailwind are both schedulers. So that means they can post for you without you actually having to um, post a tool um, yourself. They automate your post, which is really, really awesome. And then Canva is a tool which can basically make very pretty um, pictures and posts for you. And it kind of, it's like a graphic designer, um, if you like, in a, in a website. Um, and it's free. It's a, it's a free version. Tailwind and later both have free trials, but then they cost maybe £10 a month, I think. Um, but Canva is completely free for the basic version, and it's something I use a lot of. So if you want to do those swanky quote posts, um, if that fits for you, or you want to do some cool video editing, then head to Canva, and that's where most people um, actually do those posts. Okay. Um, and then, so... Moving on off social media and thinking a little bit about, um, there we go, uh, thinking a little bit about websites. I know this was a big, big question. So it's a really good idea to get a website, basically, to sum up that question. And this is what we call brand real estate. Now, social media that we've just been through is awesome. But um, it's good for building a, a following and it's easy because anyone can just go and create a social media platform and it's totally free and millions of people online, etc. But you don't own it. And I don't know if you've ever had this difficulty. Lots of my clients have unfortunately um, had this, you know, th this scare or, or this um, thing in the past where suddenly out of the blue, their Instagram account gets blocked or they get um chucked off Instagram, but they forget their password too many times and it's kind of game over. You don't get your followers back. The thing is, social media you don't own. It's rented land, if you like. You don't own your social media platform. That's really important to remember. And when you're posting content, you're thinking about the kind of way you're presenting yourself on social media, you do not own that content. Mr. Zuckerberg and his big army of social content um, managers own that content. And at any time, you're social media could be taken away. So it's a really good idea to have other ways to interact with your followers, interact with your audience and add value to your sponsors as well. And a website is a great place to do that. Um, so you can have a place where you have a very simple outline of who you are, where, you, where you're from and your story, um, and also an opportunity to share your results, share your galleries, um, share uh, the partnerships and the sponsors that you've um, been involved with. And it makes you kind of searchable on Google. So as a social manager, I've been a social media um, consultant for quite a long time. And I will have different times when my brands come to me and they go, hey, we're looking for 20 runners. Can you um, find some great runners for us? And I'm like, yeah, sure. And quick, go consult Google. And the people that come up with their websites are much easier for me to find because I can put in runner 25 to 30 in Google from the UK and I will get a list of runners you know that come up so if you're looking to get um partnering with brands and things it's a really really good idea to think about having a website now you can do website very very simply a great one page website that costs i think one pound a month um is from 123reg.com where you can buy a domain and the first year is normally about 2.99 or 99p um and so you can buy for instance for me jemimacooper.com i could buy or I did buy, in fact, in 123 Reg. And then you can create a website, which is a one-page website. So there's nothing fancy. If you just want the job to be done, basically, it's good enough. 
Um, and you can go and put your sponsors, your results, a little bit of a story and a gallery about you. And then, there you go. There is your website that you can send sponsors. You can, if you're looking to partner with someone, you can send them there. It shows that you're kind of a bit serious and your athlete brand is something that you're um, sort of um, keen to develop. It also is a place, like I said, to show off those sponsors and you own it. So you um, are in complete control of that website. You can update it regularly. You can um, put you know, different pictures on there and you can link through to your social media absolutely as well. But I'd really encourage you to get a website if you're starting to build a brand and linking in with sponsors. And in fact, sponsors is what we're going to talk about briefly um, now. So, like I said at the beginning, athlete branding is for absolutely every athlete and every power athlete at, at whatever level they are, because it's just about perception. But as is sponsorship, you are an inspirational, motivational, incredible human being. And don't forget that. Just you think how many people there are out there that really struggle to get their three minute, three times a 30 minute exercise a week. Genuinely, there's so many out there, yet you push yourself, you sweat hard and you get to that squad, you get to that training every single day or you know most days of the week. And that is really incredible. Uh, and no matter what level you are, you're not too old for this, you're not too young for this, you have the ability to positively impact people and motivate them with your story. And that means you can also connect with sponsors because sponsors ultimately want to improve their brand, their brand image, and they want to connect with audiences as well. So who should we even think about connecting um, um, for brand partnerships and sponsors? Well, the really easy and quick wins here are looking, first of all, at the products you absolutely love and believe in, because you're going to be sending a message out to your audience. And remember, it's all about perception. So you don't want to send out a message that doesn't align with your, um, your brand, the way you want to be perceived. But think about brands. You really love their philosophy. So for me, I'm quite... Um, uh, something that's important to me is sort of um, ecology and it's sort of green products and recycling, etc. So I love it when brands come to me or I, I go out to brands who have recycled packaging or like sports products that are um, got recycled packaging. And that's a big one for me. And I like connecting with partners like that. And um, so and there are other occasions where I just love the product. Absolutely love it. Like this, this um, kit I'm wearing is from a company called Trimtex and I absolutely adore Trimtex kit. I think it's the best kit um, that I've ever tried. And so I, it's an absolute joy to promote that product. So think about who you love and what you use. Next is uh, what you recommend to friends or what friends are always asking you for as well. Um, is there something like a hydration drink that you always recommend or that's really been life changing or sport changing for you? And also think about who you know. So if your dad happens to be friends with such and such um, from, I don't know, Specialized, and they can get you um, the right contact, the right person to talk to, think about the low hanging fruit. Uh, don't be ashamed to like pull on your network. We all do it in business and in entrepreneurship. And as an athlete brand, you are effectively an entrepreneur. Um, so draw on your network, see who's out there already and see where you can get those low hanging fruits. So a few good options to think about when you're looking at sponsors, clothing brands, nutrition brands, these are all very easy ones to promote because obviously like, like I say with Trimtex, I wear Trimtex like literally 20 hours, 24 seven, like, or 24 five, basically most days of the week I wear Trimtex clothes, which is very easy to promote. Nutrition brands, again, because you just show yourself eating it, sunglasses, bags, accessories, all really good stuff and recovery equipment as well. So think about, um, some of these options and think about reaching out to a few brands. Um, and when you're doing that outreach, you want to make a list of really realistic brand partners as well. So look at that low hanging fruit um, and look on social media a little bit about if there are any ambassador programs open um, or where you might really fit in. So if you've just done loads of posts about the fact that you're, um, I don't know, let's take, for example, you're a runner who absolutely loves cooking and your thing on social media is sharing healthy snack ideas, for example. Then it might make really good sense if you've just done a load of content on healthy, healthy snacks for training camp, for you then to go and reach out to um, a realistic brand partner, someone that, whose products you've used or, um, I don't know, protein powder, um, 
company, etc., and show that the, you've you've got all these posts and they've got you've got maybe like three hundred likes on each of these posts, and you're reaching out to a company that's maybe got maybe three, maybe four hundred um, likes on their posts, or like a um, a realistic brand partner. Don't try and partner with I don't know. Um, SIS, for example, science and sports, if you've only got 100 social media following, um, social media followers. But you might partner with a smaller local brand or something like that, which would work really well. Like I said, again, look at who's on your contact list and then start with those low hanging fruit and develop from there. And of course, with all of these, you can bring back in that content, that social media content to show off how great your social media is. So when you're reaching out to these brands, you go, hey, you know, my social media is really engaged. I, um, I've got a small following, but because I'm putting out so much valuable content, I like to share stuff about, um, uh, I, I break down summaries of um, data, like what data or aerodynamic data, for example, and my audience loves it. And also I've got a website which you can see how many views it's got, et cetera. So bring all this in when you're coming and, and outreaching to those partners and show, um, send them links to examples of posts that you've created that are really um, taken off with your audience, for example, um, and show how that could really benefit them as well. So you can have a, um, have a start, have, uh, start to look around, that's what I'm trying to say, start to look around for a few brands you might partner with, um, knowing that your content is really going to up the game with a relevancy um, connection and value content. Have a look at some brands, a low hanging fruit that are sort of easier to start with, and then some that are a little bit more aspirational as your audience grows. And then think about starting to identify the ways that you could bring value to that audience. So think about the kites of content that you could create that would really resonate with their audience too. And then you can go out, pitch to them and see what they say. So I've got a blog up on a mightybrand.com which um, has quite a lot of good ideas that would take this further. It's called How to Write an Athlete Sponsorship Proposal. If you search on Google, Mighty Brand, How to Write an Athlete Sponsorship Proposal, you'll be able to go um, into that. And it has some templates also for um, uh, outreaching to sponsors, which could be really useful. It's totally free and you can just find it online. So one thing when we, we go into this and what you'll see in, my, um, in that blog as well, which goes into it in more depth is, Anyone can offer a post, anyone can offer good results, um, and anyone can just be an athlete. But what you offer can be beyond that. So you offer really good content, you offer this valuable content, or you might bring other skills to the table as well. So thinking about your authentic self and how you want to present to the audience, maybe actually you as an athlete are a lot more than just an athlete, and actually you have some really interesting skills outside your sport, where you can bring all of those together because they're all part of your brand, what makes you and what makes a perception. You can bring those up to your sponsors and start to think about different ways that you could add value to the brand and add value to your audience and add value to their audience as well. And the more you think about giving to them, the more likely they will be giving to you as well. And ultimately, as you go through this, you'll start to learn what, um, what works and what sort of doesn't. And whether that's social media content, whether that's outreaching to brands, or whether that's um, sort of getting views on your blogs, et cetera, you want to start taking a little bit of note um, about what's really resonating with the audience, what's really getting people to reply to you, slipping into your DMs, or what's really going well with sponsors, and you want to do more of that. And you want to do less of what's not really working. But don't guess. Okay, so don't just think this is, you know, this is a great idea if it really, or you've just seen someone else do it, so you try it. Because for you, it may not work. It may not feel authentic. It may not feel real. And for your audience, it may not resonate. So don't guess. You can trial and error, but look at the kind of feedback you're getting from your brand objectively, whether that's people um, sort of uh, liking your posts or not liking so many of your posts. Don't take it personally. You don't need to take it as... Um, anything negative in terms of your worth or your value, just look at it objectively. Okay, 
maybe this didn't get so many likes. Maybe it was, um, I was trying to do relevancy content, but it didn't quite work. So maybe people don't actually want to know about, I don't know, healthy meals. What they actually want to know about is gym workouts. And just change and adapt according to that feedback you're getting in. So it's simple as that. More of what's working, less of what doesn't. It's trial, it's error with brand to begin with, but as you start to learn who you're talking to, as you start to step into that confident version of yourself in your athlete brand, then it will just grow and grow and you'll start to um, identify what works more and more and create more and more of that. And then it's a nice circle of development and you'll grow and grow that super fan base, that sponsorship base, and I have no doubt you'll be successful from there. So obviously we've covered so much in today's um, sort of webinar and there's loads of material that I've just thrown at you. So you might take a few um, watches of the replay and do feel free to go back and try again um, and you know, listen again and, and go back over any of this stuff. On the My Athlete Brand website, I have a blog um, quite a lot of blogs up there as well. That website is not going to be up for um, hugely much longer because there's a few shifts in my company going on. But for now, there's quite a lot of blogs. So you can always um, uh, sort of screenshot any of the interesting stuff that you found, for example, or stuff to help you. There's some lots of freebies on there as well. But you can head over to the blog to extend your learning. But also listen to podcasts, listen to audiobooks, um, and read. There's some, uh, if you want some tips, you can um, send me a message in the Facebook group or pass on to Fiona for sort of books and things to read. But there's loads and loads and loads and loads and loads of resources on uh, online um, and offline in books um, to advance your learning here. But I'd really recommend just spending a little bit of time um, in learning and educating yourself on building that personal brand. As athletes, we think it's all about the sport, but as you step up and as you step into college and you have to start uh, firefighting on, on your own and paying for rent and all of the other things that we all will have to do, it's really important that we have the skills that enable us to make our sport a financial reality. And then this is where it starts. And it's actually awesome that you guys are listening in and you're here tonight because you're, you're really differentiating yourselves from so many athletes that won't be doing this. So it puts you in a very favorable position as you're stepping up your game. But don't let it stop here. You know, dedicate 10 minutes, 15 minutes, whilst you're doing your rehab or your prehab or the gym stuff or um, cooking pasta one night, whatever. Just pop on a 10 minute YouTube video learning X about social media or um, something about sponsorship outreach, et cetera. Just expand your awareness. And I'd really encourage you to just do a little bit of training in personal branding or athlete branding too, as you go through. Okay, ladies and gents, well, thank you so much for your time and attention, and it's been a long one, so um, thank you if you're still around here. But I've just got a few minutes for um, questions if anyone has them. I'm gonna come back online. You guys can unmute yourself if you like. Um, but shoot me any questions that you have. We can put them in for those here. We can put them in the chat box, but also, and the Facebook group. And if there's anything else anyone wants confirming on, any more questions, you can shoot them over to Fiona, who will pass them on to me, I'm sure. And I'm very happy to answer. Awesome. So hang on, I, uh, do I have to unmute you? There we go. Oh, there you are, you're unmuted. Gem, that was absolutely awesome. Thank you so much. You've just given no up so much information to absorb and digest. And yeah, I think they're just going to be going back and flicking backwards and forwards and sort of re-listening to what you've just said. Um, but I did have one question and I you know, obviously don't want to take up too much of your time, but let's say one of our athletes did um, get approached by a sponsor. Um, what sort of things can they start to ask for and what sort of things can they sort of offer in return? Okay, so um, like I said, it's like really very much about focusing on what you can do for them. Lots of athletes and um, lots of athletes come to the brand and they go, I'm great because I've done this competition, this competition, this competition, and I'm doing X, Y, Z competition next year. I really need free stuff to help me build my, you know, get me to the next competition. Or I would really look for a sponsor to help me up my game, the end basically. And that's what you get as a brand. And as a brand, that's not, I mean, that's great and well done and it's an amazing story, but how is that really going to sell my product? Or how is that really going to ad, uh, advance my marketing or build my brand as a business? 
I don't know. So you've got to put yourself in your in the brand shoes. You've got to take yourself out of it and put the brand into your head. And think about if you were a business owner, how would you be able to partner with an athlete to sell products? So you want to go um, thinking about what you can give them. So don't even like the, the results are nice and you can put that somewhere in your email, but lead with a, hey, you know, I saw that you um, have, have um, lots of your social media content is focused on XYZ charity. And that's awesome. I've seen your post. I'm really keen that you're uh, sponsoring this charity for this event. I am also very interested in supporting that cause. And I would love to create some content for you, or I'd love to do some videos to support you in that activation, for example. So thinking about how you can, um, create great content for them that's going to work with their audience or how you can add value in different ways So not necessarily just social media because you may be someone that only has 500 followers which isn't super exciting for a brand when there's lots of influencers out there but you may have a great skill so maybe you're a triathlete for example a teenage triathlete let's say and you are awesome at bike mechanics and all of your friends all of your teammates come to you for bike mechanics but you've got like 100 followers and like 10 of them are your aunts and uncles on, on Instagram. Your Instagram's not going to be exciting. And hey, you know, you're an elite athlete stepping up, but really in the grand scheme of things, you don't have a gold medal and you haven't been to Kona, you haven't been to the World Championship. So what can you give? Well, what about you go, hey, you know, I would love, you go off to a local bike shop and say, hey, I would love to do a webinar on bike mechanics because I know so many people from my club, for example, are asking me how to change a tire. How about I just do a webinar or I do a little video that you can share with your audience um, about the, the quickest way to learn how to do uh, chaining your tire or oiling your chain or some really simple things like that. So you're, you're giving value in a different way. If you're confident, you could even say, Hey, you know, I could come to your shop one night and we could set up a mechanics for beginners, like opportunity. And you could partner with that bike shop and they could help you out and they could help organize it, but you could be there and like add value that way. So really think outside the box, not only about your sport and not about your sponsors, but how you can add value to them and put yourself, put your business head on and think, if I own this business, how would I partner with me to give more, sell more products or, or build that business out? That's what I'd say. Brilliant. Absolutely fabulous. Great, great advice. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. And guys, I can wholeheartedly recommend go on to um, the My Athlete Brand website. Have a listen to Gems of the podcast. She's done, you've done three or four podcast Gemini? yeah yeah this is slowing down this is, like i said a few changes around so um, it slowed down but there are a few a few quite valuable ones on there for extending extending this and there's some good blogs like i say with some good freebies attached so um if you're wanting to kind of look more for sponsors and things like that there's some good blogs that will which will break this down in, in more step by step as well yeah brilliant well thank you so much i would say to everybody like i say um when i'm working with athletes about consistency in their training um just give it a go try something it would be maybe a little bit out of your comfort zone for some of you i certainly would be if it was me doing this um but little baby steps i guess it doesn't have to be perfect but just nope. making a messy is better messy and done is always better than a perfect and procrastinated over so you just get it out there and you'll learn from it like i said this is a case of just a learning exercise and if you guys want any tips you can connect with me on instagram i'm at jen cooper um, and you can send me even if you want to send me a draft post or something like that just shoot it my way and we can we can chat over and i can give you any tips as well so feel free to do that brilliant oh thanks jen we'll have a lovely evening